The following is a presentation of the Steamboat Church of Christ in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. We hope that you find today's lesson presented by our minister, Dr. Joseph Becker, informative, insightful, and inspirational. For the last two weeks, we've been looking at the miraculous draw of fish on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias, paying particular attention to John's report as to the number of fish caught. Because John seems to go out of his way to tell us that exactly 153 fish were drawn from the water that day. And while the text tells us that the nets were quite full, too full to be lifted into the boat, and that the fish themselves were quite large, still, the number itself isn't all that impressive. No, this draw of fish is large, but its immensity isn't the most remarkable thing about it. The miraculous draught at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus was more massive in terms of volume. In that draught, according to Luke 5, 6 through 7, the catch was so large that the nets began to break and two fishing trawlers nearly sank under the load of the haul. And the quantity of fish produced at the feeding of the 5,000 was greater still, being enough to make about 20,000 portions. Remember, 5,000 is merely the estimate of the number of adult males that were fed. It does not account for the women and children. So it's clear that in John 21, when we're told that 153 fish were caught, that number is not intended to impress, but to inform. Yet, to inform of what? Well, most likely that that which the apostles had lain hold of that morning was to be understood as more than the contents of the net, but also as a sign. But to what might the number 153 point? Well, we've established in previous lessons that no answer to that question can be found in traditional biblical numerology. Because the study of numerology is based on identifying patterns in the repeated occurrences of a given number, and there are not enough occurrences of the number 153 in Scripture to establish a pattern. However, there are other disciplines of study that may be of help, and last week I made a case for using biblical gematria to help unravel this mystery. Now, last week I gave you a pretty thorough account of what is involved in this field of study. And if you want to learn more about that, I invite you to go online and listen to last week's lesson there, number 386 in this series, Biblical Gematria. For the purposes of today's lesson, let me just say that in our present culture, when we want to express a number, we have access to a complete set of glyphs apart from words and letters, set aside for that very purpose, Arabic numerals. However, the advent of Arabic numerals, the advent of having a whole separate set of glyphs to represent numbers, is a fairly recent development, dating back only as far as about 700 A.D. Prior to that time, most languages in the world used alphabetical characters to represent numbers. In Latin, the Romans used M, D, C, L, X, V, and I to represent numbers. And in other ancient languages, numbers were most often expressed with alphabetical characters. In Hebrew, every letter of the alphabet had a numeric value. And because of this, every word had a numeric value. And going back at least as far as the Assyrian captivity, the educated in Hebrew culture were using numbers as a way of communicating with one another in code which code is known as gematria. Now, the word gematria or gematria is a Hebrew term which is derived from a conflation of two Greek words, geometria, which is the word from which we get geometry, and grammatea, which means the knowledge of writing. And this is reflective of the fact that in order to make use of gematria, one must be literate, numerate, and cryptoficient. That is, good at puzzles. Now, at this point, you may be asking, what, interesting as that may be, does that have to do with Bible study? Because no science that is foreign to Scripture has any warrant on Scripture. That, as I pointed out last week, is part of the problem with things like the Bible code. Because the cipher it applies to the Hebrew text is a complete intrusion on Holy Scripture, having no foundation in the Bible itself. But that is not the case when it comes to gematria. Because not only is gematria inherent to the text of the Old Testament being a feature of the Hebrew language itself, but there is at least one biblical author who we know was well versed in gematria and who used that discipline in his biblical writings. And that's the Apostle John. In Revelation 13, 18, John presents us with a number, which number he tells us corresponds by way of code to a man's name. 
The number is 666, and the man's name is Nero Caesar. And the path from the number to the name is through Hebrew gematria. And it's this same author, John, who presents us with the conspicuous number 153 in John 21. And in my opinion, this gives us sufficient grounds upon which to apply this cipher to the miraculous draught of the 153 fish to see what it may yield. This I have done, and the results are very interesting. <laughs> At least they're interesting to me. I hope they're interesting to you. In John 21, 1 through 14, we read that following a night of fishing and having caught nothing, Jesus told the apostles to cast their nets to starboard. They did so, and their nets were filled with such a draught of fish that they could not pull them into the boat. Yet the nets did not break. When the boat reached the shore, the apostles counted the fish and found there to be 153 of them. And as this number is presented, it would seem to indicate that whatsoever it signifies has, like unto the fish, been given by the Lord into the hands of the apostles. And that this placement is secure, that it is irrevocable. After all, the nets were not broken, even though they were strained. So to what does the number 153 point? Well, there are five Hebrew words or phrases in the Old Testament that in gematria have a numeric value of 153. And every one of them could fit the bill in its own way. First, we have the word pegah, which means happenstance, occurrence, chance. Now, this word appears only once in the Old Testament, but that one appearance is noteworthy, to say the least. In Ecclesiastes 9.11, Solomon tells us, I returned and saw that under the sun the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but timing and chance, pick all, 153, betide them all. Now when Solomon said that, he said a mouthful, because here he's giving voice to an observation which is true, but which is easily misunderstood and easily corrupted. Because chance is a measure of the likelihood that a given event will occur, which likelihood is usually expressed as the ratio of favorable cases to the whole number of cases possible. So, for instance, in the case of a coin toss, the likelihood of a given toss coming up heads is described as a 50-50 chance. But the way that people tend to talk about chance indicates that they believe that there is a force or an entity called chance that is operating on that coin toss to cause it to come up heads 50% of the time. So, for instance, if I were to flip a coin and it came up heads six times in a row, there are lots of people who would bet money that the seventh toss would come up tails. And their reasoning has to do with the notion that the coin has been resisting the force of chance, or the power of chance, which force is irresistible. And the longer the coin resists the force of chance, the more that force builds up until eventually the coin will yield to the power of chance and will come up tails, just as chance dictates that it should. But, beloved, I hope that you recognize that that kind of thinking is nothing but a form of animism, nothing but a form of superstition. Because the truth of the matter is that the chances of any coin toss coming up heads is 50-50, and those odds don't dictate anything. They merely describe probability. Because when it comes to truly random events, prior outcomes have no effect on current events. Which is to say that the fact that the coin came up head six times in a row has no effect on the seventh coin toss. The odds of every coin toss is the same. Accordingly, in Ecclesiastes 9.11, Solomon, who is wise and would know that, cannot possibly be telling us that there is a hidden force called chance that sets skill and training and knowledge and planning at naught. And it certainly doesn't seem to pin unexpected outcomes on the direct providence of God. Rather, he is telling us that in spite of skill, training, knowledge, and planning, unlikely and unforeseen and indeed unforeseeable outcomes often occur. And we've all seen that happen on numerous occasions. But when such things happen, we should take care because it's one thing to say, what are the odds? But it's another thing entirely to say, well, that was just meant to be. Because whatever you say that was meant to be, you had better be prepared to answer the question, meant by whom?
because according to Solomon, there's a degree of randomness built into the warp and woof of the fabric of creation. God is sovereign over everything, but in his sovereignty, he chooses not to control everything. And according to Solomon, he doesn't give us control over everything either. No, some things are left to timing and chance. But make no mistake about it, timing and chance are not things, and they certainly do not have minds. They are not capable of forming intent. And the things that come about as a result of timing and chance are by no means meant to be. No, indeed, what Solomon is telling us in Ecclesiastes 9.11 is the opposite of that. Not everything happens for a reason. Some things just happen. And that is a state of affairs that has been ordained, or at least allowed, by God. That's what's indicated by the Hebrew word hegah, chance. And as such, that may be the target to which the sign of the 153 fish points. If so, then that would indicate that in this miracle, the Lord was granting the apostles a degree of sovereignty over chance. Now stop and think about that for a minute. Let that sink in. Because Solomon knew what he was talking about. His observations are wise and true. Under the sun, timing and chance do in fact betide us all. But if the cipher in John 21.11 points to chance, then that would indicate that God, who had previously left chance ungoverned, has granted the church a degree of sovereignty over chance. If so, then that is a blessing that can be contained and which is irrevocable. After all, the nets, though stressed, did not break. And that helps us to flesh out passages like Romans 8.28, where Paul tells us, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And Ephesians 1.11, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, according to the counsel of his will. And John 16.33, where Jesus says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now those are claims that could not be made under the Old Covenant. And it would seem that the point in time in which it was granted to us to overcome happenstance may well be on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias in the miraculous draught of the 153 fish. Second, the number 153 in John 21 could be pointing to the word paga, which means to meet, to encounter, to intercept, to intersect as a cross, or to intercede. And this is a word that's used often in the Old Testament when the path of God and the path of humankind intersect. For instance, in Genesis 32, 2 through 3, we read that while Jacob was going on his way, he encountered, Pagah, 153, the angels of God. And when he saw them, he said, this place must be God's headquarters. So he named the place Mahanaim. And the name Mahanaim means parallel headquarters indicating that this location was a crossroads where heaven and earth intersect. Again, in 1 Samuel 10, 5-7, Samuel tells Saul, Go to Gibeath Elohim, where there is a Philistine outpost. As you approach the town, you will encounter, Pagah 153, a procession of prophets coming down from the high place with lyres, timbrels, pipes, and harps being played before them, and they will be prophesying. The Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be changed into a different person. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatsoever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. And here again, an intersection between heaven and earth seems to be in view. Then in Isaiah 53, 4-12, we find the following, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has confronted, Pagah 153, in him, the iniquity of us all. Then skipping to verse 12, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and intercedes, Pagah 153, for the transgressors. 
This passage, of course, refers to Christ, who stood at the crossroads between heaven and earth, and for our sakes encountered and withstood the righteousness of the Father. And that point of encounter is what's indicated by the Hebrew word pagah, which word has a numeric value of 153, and as such may be the target to which the sign of the 153 fish points. If so, then that would indicate that in this miracle the Lord was granting the apostles a degree of sovereignty over our encounters with God. Now let that sink in for a moment. Because if the cipher in John 21.11 points to encounters with God, then that would indicate that God, who had previously met with his people only at prescribed times and in prescribed places, has granted the church a degree of sovereignty over those encounters. And that is a blessing we can contain and which is irrevocable. After all, the nets, though stressed, did not break. And if that's what's in view, that would certainly help us to flesh out Matthew 18, 18 through 20, where Jesus says, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I among them. According to Jesus, any time two or more of us gather in his name, we will have an encounter with the Lord. And this gives us an unprecedented degree of sovereignty in our encounters with God. Because any time we need him, we can summon him by gathering together in his name and calling on him. That is a claim that could not be made under the Old Covenant. And the point in time when it was granted to us to take ownership of our encounters with God may well have been on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias in the miraculous draught of the 153 fish. Third, the number 153 in John 21 could be pointing to the word Bezalel, which means in the shadow of God. But here the connection is not through the meaning of Bezalel's name, but through the mission of the man himself. In Exodus 31, 1-5, we find the following. The Lord said unto Moses, Behold, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, tribesman of Judah, and have filled him with the Spirit of God. And I have made him a master of all trades. I have given him knowledge, skill, ability, and a discerning eye. He is a master architect, a master goldsmith, a master silversmith, a master coppersmith, a master stonecutter, a master woodcarver, a master of every craft. And again in Exodus 37, 1 through 9, Bezalel made the ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half was its length, a cubit and a half its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. And he overlaid it with pure gold inside and out, and made a molding of gold around it. Then skipping to verse 6, and he made the mercy seat of pure gold. Now, the significance here may be less than obvious, so let me give you a hint. Bezalel made the Ark of the Covenant. Bezalel made the mercy seat. It was God who made the design, but it was Bezalel who rolled up his sleeves, put hands to tools, and with the sweat of his brow constructed the dwelling place of God on earth. And his name has a numeric value of 153. And as such, he may be the target to which the sign of 153 fish points. If so, then that would indicate that in this miracle the Lord was granting the apostles, and in this case I think the apostles alone, the privilege of being the craftsmen who would roll up their sleeves, put hands to tools, and with the sweat of their brows construct the dwelling place of God on earth under the new covenant, the church. Now let that sink in for a moment. Because if the cipher in John 21 points to Bezalel, then what's in view in that passage is the apostles as co-workers with God in the construction of the church. And that would certainly help to flesh out passages like 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 9, where Paul says, What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are co-workers with God, and you are God's field, God's building. And the point in time when it was granted to the apostles to be, those skilled craftsmen may well have been on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias in the miraculous draught of the 153 fish. And if so, then that is a blessing that can be contained 
and which is irrevocable. After all, the nets, though stressed, did not break. Fourth, the number 153 in John 21 could be pointing to the word Pesach, which means Passover. In Exodus 12, 1 through 13, we find the following. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire. With unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head and legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Passover, the Pesach, 153, of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And here the significance ought to be obvious, because Christ instituted the Lord's Supper at the Passover feast, and he himself was crucified at the very hour that the Passover lambs in every home in Israel and at the temple were being sacrificed. And in 1 Corinthians 5, 6-8, Paul tells us, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And we know that the Passover, manifested in the Lord's Supper, was given to the apostles to administer to the church. As Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11, 23-26, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had gracified it, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So if the cipher of John 21 points to the Passover, then the moment when it was granted to the apostles to take ownership of the Passover may well be on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias in the miraculous draught of the 153 fish. If so, then that is a blessing that can be contained and which is irrevocable. After all, the nets, though stressed, did not break. Then fifth and finally, the number 153 in John 21 could be pointing to the phrase Ben Elohim, which means sons of God. And I find this to be amazing, because though the earliest references in Scripture to the sons of God seem to be references to divine beings, as with the sons of God in Genesis 6, who took the daughters of men as their wives, and the sons of God in the book of Job, who attend on God and his courts, Still, in the main, the term sons of God is used to refer to God's chosen people. That's the case, for instance, in Hosea 1.10. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, You are sons of the living God. And the Hebrew phrase, sons of God, in Hebrew gematria, has a numeric value of 153. And here, the pathway to closing the loop with the New Testament is clear and unmistakable. No supposition needs to be made, because the name, sons of God, shifts seamlessly from the chosen of Israel to the chosen in Christ under the New Covenant. And this is testified to over and over in the New Testament. John 1.12, But to all who did receive him who believed in his name, he gave the right to become sons of God. 
Romans 8, 14, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Philippians 2, 14 through 15, do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent, sons of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. 1 John 3, 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called the sons of God. Now when you take all that and put it together with the fact that the Lord told the apostles at the onset of his ministry that he would make them fishers of men, and the whole thing comes effortlessly full circle. Indeed, I didn't even need to give you those last five references. As soon as I told you that the phrase sons of God had a numeric value of 153, you immediately connected all the dots yourselves. And for my part, that settles the question of the significance of the number 153 in John 21. To the best of my knowledge, if we are persuaded that this number has significance, then using biblical gematria, there are five things to which that ensign might point. It could point to chance. It could point to encounters with God. It could point to Bezalel. It could point to the Passover or it could point to the sons of God. Now, there are actually two more choices. It could point to none of these, but I think you all know by now that that's pretty unlikely. Or, it could point to all of them. Clearly, if this is a case of Hebrew gematria, then John's target audience would have been those who are versed in that field of study, and those who are so versed would make all the connections I've discussed today, and they would probably agree that whatsoever the number 153 does signify has, like the fish, been given by the Lord into the hands of the apostles, and that this placement is secure. It is irrevocable. After all, the nets were not broken, even though they were strained. And all five things to which this number points have indeed been given irrevocably into the hands of the apostles. Now, that makes me comfortable suggesting that the number 153 here may point to all five things, but not everyone will be comfortable with that. There are lots of people who would find it much more satisfactory, much more satisfying if the ensign were proven to be single, if we could narrow down the foci to one target. And in consideration of that ethic, if I have to choose, the choice is obvious, because there can be no mistaking the fact that the number 153 in John 21 points to the sons of God. And we are the sons of God, and we have been given irrevocably into the hands of the apostles who govern the church through the written word. Now, I find that pretty satisfactory. I'm pretty pleased with that outcome. But it does raise a curious question. If the 153 captured in the miraculous draw to fish on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias represent the sons of God, if those 153 signify the saved, if the fishes in that net represent you and me and every beloved soul who has confessed the name of the Lord and obeyed the gospel, why did the apostles eat them? <laughs> why didn't the Lord have a tank ready for them that the apostles might put them in the tank, feed them, and care for them? Or why didn't they tag them and release them back into the lake so they could be in the world, but not of the world? Why, of all things, did the apostles, who are fishers of men, eat their catch? After all, this is what the text tells us happened. John 21, 9 through 12, when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. But why would they do that with the sons of God? Come back next week. <laughs> and I'll tell you. That's my lesson for today. This has been a presentation of the Steamboat Church of Christ. We hope that you have found Dr. Becker's message well appointed. To hear more lessons like this one, visit our website at www.steamboatchurch.org or come see us at 1698 Lincoln Avenue in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Bible classes are Sunday mornings at 9.30 and worship services are at 10.30. We look forward to meeting you. Until then, may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.